Hello friends. Can we take a moment to talk about the black phone? Because I absolutely love this movie. This video will contain pretty much the whole movie, so needless to say, spoiler alert and trigger warning for some graphic content. The first trailer dropped in October of 2021 and when I first saw it, I was already hooked. The movie is based on a short story called The Black Phone by Stephen King's son, Joe Hill. The story is only like 30 pages long and not to brag, I finished the whole thing in a day. There are definitely some differences between the book and the movie, but I'll talk about that a little later. We get taken back to 1978. We start the movie off by watching the main character, 13 year old Finney Blake, pitch a softball. His pitching skills are impressive, but ultimately he does lose the game. After the game, the players shake each other's hand and Bruce Yamada, the batter who won the game, comes up to Finney to say, Man, your arm is mint. You almost had him. We follow Bruce cycling home until a black van shows up. Some time goes by and Finney and his sister Gren are walking towards school. On their way, they come across a renewed missing poster of Bruce Armada and Finney's friend Robin beating up some bully. Robin's got some skills, so he easily takes down the bully. Walking away from the fight, Gwen tells us that Robin is the toughest kid in school because another kid, Vance Hopper, has been taken by the grabber. At school, Finney has his own bullies to deal with. They chase him into the bathroom where, luckily, Robin is there to save the day. After the bullies leave, Robin tells him, I've seen Texas Chainsaw Massacre Friday night, you seen it? Wait, that can't be it. You're gonna have to stand up for yourself one of these days. Okay, that's better. On their way back home, Gwen goes to Susie's place as she goes every Friday and Finney just goes home to watch a super scary movie. I told you this movie was scary. He's woken up the next morning by Gwen screaming. Now I'm not gonna show you this scene because it can be very triggering for some people. So this is a warning. If you don't wanna see it, skip to this time frame. All right, we all good? Let's continue. So their dad was basically punishing Gwen for talking to the detectives about her dreams. Apparently she has dreams that sometimes come true. And this time she had a dream about black balloons. These black balloons were found at every crime scene. The grabber has taken children. All I'm gonna say about this scene is that it was very brutal to watch and I mean that with the greatest of compliments because this scene was so believable, so heartbreaking and so hard to watch. Madeline McGraw did an amazing job of acting this scene, like props to her. She did an awesome job. Anyway, we're gonna move on now. We cut to Robin just minding his own business when a black van shows up again and a man with a cape walks out of it. After hearing about Robin, Finney asks his sister if she can have another dream. Unfortunately, she doesn't have control over her dreams. Without Robin, there's no one to stop the bullies from beating up Finn, and that's exactly what they do. Gwen tries to help, but unfortunately gets kicked in the face. But hey, look at the bright side. At least this whole incident got the attention of Finny's crush. So that's a plus. Walking home, Gwen goes to Susie's place because it's Friday again. Walking home alone, Finney comes across a man 
who's fumbling with his groceries, dropping them to the ground. After Finney hands back the man's hat, he notices some black balloons in his van. And I think we all know what happens next. Finney slowly wakes up as he's dropped onto a mattress. This is where we get our first look at this badass mask. The grabber leaves, giving Finney the opportunity to look around the room. He finds a toilet, some carpet rolls, and a black phone. Of course he tries the phone, but the cables are cut, so it won't work. Disappointed, he lays back on the mattress. After sleeping for a while, he gets woken up by the phone ringing. Confused, he picks it up, but before he can say anything, is interrupted by the grabber, telling him it doesn't work. He's come down to say that he'll have to be upstairs for a while, because something's come up. After pleading with the grabber to let him go, Finney says that he'll scream, but the grabber soundproofed the room, so he won't hear him. Before the grabber can shut the door, Finney says that he's the one that killed the others. To which the grabber responds that it wasn't him. It was somebody else. And that he wouldn't do anything that he wouldn't like. Finney says that he'll scratch his face if he tries to touch him. This is where we get this iconic scene. This face... After Finney hangs up the phone, Grabber tells us that he heard the phone ring once, but there was no one at the other end. The Grabber leaves again, and Finney tries to scream, tries to jump up to the window, tries to move the mattress, but in the end he stops himself, telling himself that if there was a way to escape, someone would have done it already. Robin would have done it already. He's not getting out of here. As he's telling himself this, the phone rings again. This time, he's able to pick it up and ask if anyone's there. But unfortunately, there's no one at the other end. He falls back asleep. He's woken up by the phone, pulsating. He's scared completely awake when he finds the grabber watching him. When Finney asks him why he came down here if he didn't bring him any food, with tears in his eyes, he tells him he just wanted to look at him. Finney tries to get some sleep, but is woken up again by the ringing of the black phone. This time, there's a whispery voice saying, Shocked, Finney hangs up the phone and scurries back. The phone starts to ring again, but this time it's just non-stop ringing. Finney bravely answers the phone, and the voice tells him not to hang up. Finney asks who it is, but the voice doesn't remember his name. Apparently, that's the first thing you lose when you die. Finney asks how the voice knew his name. The voice tells him, Your arm is mint. You almost had me. Of course, Finney recognizes Bruce and asks. The phone rang for him. Apparently, the phone rung for everyone, but nobody heard it. Bruce is glad it's Finney. He tells Finney there's a dirt section in the hallway where the tiles are loose. He tried to dig a tunnel, but there wasn't enough time to get out. The conversation ends, and we see glimpses of Bruce's life up until the moment the crabber got him. 
This is done in an old movie style, as a nod to the creator's other movie, Sinister. These glimpses are what Gwenny sees in her dreams. We get back to Finney. He's digging a hole where Bruce told him to, disposing of the dirt in the toilet and flushing away the evidence. After digging for hours, he covers the hole with one of the carpets. Completely exhausted, he plops on a mattress and falls asleep. The next morning, the grabber brings him some breakfast. When he leaves, he forgets to lock the door. Finney hesitantly walks towards the door. But before he can open it, the phone rings again. A different voice tells him not to go upstairs. The grabber's waiting on Finney to go upstairs so he can beat him with a belt. Finney asks him who he is, but of course he doesn't remember. All he remembers is that he used to deliver newspapers. He tells Finney what happened to him when he went upstairs. Despite the warning, Finney goes to check. But before ascending up the stairs, he decides... Nope. Finney hurries back into the room, but we are taken upstairs to see what was waiting for Finney, and this is what most people had to say about this scene. Yeah, I would suck his dick. Finney gets some rest after eating breakfast, but is awoken again by the ringing of the phone. It's the same voice as before. He doesn't want to be called Billy, the name he had before he died, because it's not who he is anymore. He's Paperboy now. Paperboy tells Finney about a cable he yanked loose. He hid it between the tiles and the wall. He shows Finney how to use the cable by spinning a bottle and pointing it towards the grate in the window. We cut back to Gwenny, having a dream about Paperboy. The dream ends the grabber standing in front of a house, holding black balloons. We cut back to Finney, who's found an ingenious way to get the cable around the grate. He tries to get the window open, but before it can reach the latch, the grate falls off the window, and Finney plummets to the ground. Before I continue the story, it needs to be said that Mason Thames, the actor playing Finney in this movie, would make a perfect younger version of Nathan Drake. Not only does he look exactly like Tom Holland, more so than Tom Holland's actual brothers, he also has the whole Nathan breaking thing down already. Okay, back to the video. That night, Gwenny finds the courage to talk to their father about her dreams. This is where we find out that Gwenny's mother used to have the same dreams. They used to tell her to do things, terrible things, and eventually it drove her to take her own life. Her father doesn't want the same for her, but he eventually gives in when Gwenny tells him that her dreams might be able to help them fight Finney. We get to see the detectives in action when they question a strange man called Max, who's apparently been investigating on his own. Unfortunately, they don't take him seriously as they see the lines of, uh, let's call it powdered sugar on the table. They only tell him to clean it up before his brother gets home. As he's taking another sniff of uh, powdered sugar, we get taken down to the basement where we see Finney sitting on the mattress. The next morning, the grabber brings him breakfast again. He asks Finney for his name. Finney is confused on why he cares. The grabber says that he usually doesn't care, but everything's different. Nothing's going right. He's thinking about letting Finney go. If he tells him his name, Finney gives him a fake name. But the grabber knew that already. He saw his name in the papers. He angrily drops his breakfast, stepping out of the shadows, revealing his mask. The grabber walks out again, leaving the door unlocked. Angrily, 
Finney walks towards the door. But before he can open it, the phone rings again. But there's no one. That night, Finney's woken up by a dripping noise. He uses his flashlight to pan towards the noise. There's a kid floating. There's blood dripping off of his hand. Slowly, he points his hand towards the phone. Finney obediently picks it up. There's another voice telling him he doesn't have much time. The grabber hasn't been sleeping. He's worried that this might be it. That his brother is going to figure it out. Finney asks him why he hasn't been killed. The voice tells him it's because he hasn't been playing the game. A game called Naughty Boy. If he doesn't play Naughty Boy, he can't beat him and move on to the next part. The voice repeats that he doesn't have much time and that the grabber hasn't slept. But he's sleeping now and the door's still unlocked. Nervously, Finney asks if he should just go. But the voice tells him that his old bite lock is on the door. He can't remember the combination, but he wrote it down on the wall. Fortunately, there are only five numbers on the wall, leaving Finney with three possible combinations. Since the voice doesn't remember, he's gonna have to try them all. Finney slowly makes his way up the stairs, walking past the grabber, slowly towards the door. He quietly tries the first combination, but it doesn't work. So he tries the second one, it doesn't work. On the third one, the lock clicks, setting off a dog who heard it in the other room. This wakes up the grabber, who goes after Finney. He eventually catches him and knocks him out after saying, <laughs> Nighty night, naughty boy. Finney wakes up to the phone ringing again. This time, it's Pinball Vance, who we see in Gwenny's dream moments later. He's beating up some kid who disrupted his game, carving a number in his arm. When he goes along in the police car as Vance is taken to a house, this house has the same number as the one he carved in the kid's arm. Back in the room, Pinball Vance tells Finney about a spot in the wall he needs to break into to get into the freezer and get out. Finney uses the toilet cover to break into the wall and a ring from the toilet to loosen the screws that hold the panel to the wall. When he's finally in the freezer, he finds that it's filled with meat. He tries to break open the door, but it won't budge. Completely defeated, he crawls out of the freezer and for the first time, he cries. The phone rings again. This time, it's Robin telling Finn he's with him. He's been with him this whole time. Robin's dad didn't leave his buddies behind in Vietnam. That's why he didn't come home. And Robin's not coming home either. But he's not gonna leave him. Robin asks if Finney remembers what he told him. Remember? He told him. I need to see Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Wait, no, oh, that can't be right. Someday I have to stand up for myself. Okay, that's better. Robin shows him how to use the phone as a weapon. But to pack a punch, he needs to fill the phone with dirt so he won't be able to speak with any of them again before hanging up. Finney tells Robin he misses him. He responds. Robin says to get out for them use what they gave him. The call ends and Finney prepares for battle. We cut to Gwenny cycling around in the rain. She's wearing a yellow raincoat. 
as a not so subtle nod to Stephen King's It. As she's cycling, she's stopped by all the ghost kids falling off of her bike right in front of the house. She surprisingly does the smart thing and goes home to call the detectives. We pan back and forth to the police scrambling to go to the house. Max slowly figuring out it's his brother and the grabber getting his supplies. The lights in the room switch on and the door slowly creaks open. But it's not the grabber opening the door. It's Max. But before it can free Finny, the grabber drives an axe through his head. The grabber blames Finny for what he had to do. So he's gonna do it slow. To really, really hurt him. He calls his cunning corso down and ties him to a wall. The grabber swings an axe at Finny, but he dodges. Making his way towards the toilet, he yanks on the cable, putting enough tension on it to trip the grabber. In trying to catch himself, his foot slips into the hole Bruce told him to dig, where he breaks his ankle on the grate from the window. With the grabber stuck in the hole, Finny takes a few swings with the phone, like Robin taught him. Eventually, the grabber takes hold of Finny, and in trying to escape, Finny rips off his mask, sending him into a screaming fit. Finny takes this opportunity to hit him a bit more, eventually tying the cord around his neck. As he's choking the grabber, the phone rings again. Finny slowly puts the receiver to the grabber's ear and calmly tells him, It's for you. Now, for the first time, the grabber gets to hear the voices on the other end. Welcome to the nightmare end of your pathetic little life. <laughs> you don't have much time. <laughs> Today's the day, motherfucker. I can't kill you, you de puta. So Finn is gonna do it for me. Finn's arm is mint. <laughs> really quick in between. Did anyone else got the same feeling I did when I first watched this scene? Hold on, I'll show you what I mean. Do it for me! Finn's arm is mint! With the grabber out of the way, Finny now only has the dog to deal with. He uses the meat from the freezer to throw the other direction. And as the dog is distracted, he makes his way up the stairs towards the front door, where he uses the code to open the bike lock and walk out. Finny makes his way into the yard, where he sees Gwenny sitting across the street. Apparently the house her dreams had been leading her to was the place where the grabber had been hiding the bodies. Imagine going through all of that, and the first thing you see when you get out it's your sister, who was just so close to finding you. As they hug each other, Finny tells the police that the grabber's in the basement. As it gets dark, we see Finny and Gwen sitting next to each other in a police car, their dad running towards them. Crying, he asks for forgiveness for everything that he's done, but they don't give an answer right away. And they don't need to. We end the movie with Finny. Back in school. With newfound confidence. As he sits down next to his crush. He tells her to call him Finn. Like I said this movie was inspired by a book. But they basically only took the concept of Bruce talking to Finny. Who was actually named John in the book. And the only mention of Finney's, aka Johnny's sister in the book, is actually that she's called Susanna. And I think Susie is a reference to that. There are no mentions of premonitions or anything like that whatsoever. 
there are some lines that are taken directly from the book, but all in all, I think they took a lot of creative liberty with this movie. One thing I do want to mention is that the grabber in the book is called Fat L. And let's just say he had a different body type in the movie. In my opinion, this movie was absolutely amazing. I mean, sure, it wasn't the scariest movie ever. But in my opinion, it didn't have to be. All the characters were amazing and they were portrayed beautifully by all these actors. It has everything I love in movies. It has an interesting story. Amazing cinematography. A lot of sad moments and even some funny moments. You dumb fucking fart knockers. Gwendolyn Blake. Jesus, what the fuck? Like I said before, that moment where Finney breaks the grabber's neck while Bruce is talking to him over the phone was so rewarding to watch. I do recommend you watch the movie, but if you can't handle the jump scares, I've listed the timestamps below so you don't have to watch them. Thank you for watching or listening in the background because your attention span is so short that you can't do just one thing at a time. Remember, you're a wonderful human being. You are loved. You are worthy. And you matter.